On the side of the Pennines, just as moorland gives way to pastures, lies the East Lancashire village of Worsthorne. The village has one news agent, John Nutto, but perhaps the villagers don't realise that in John, they also have one of the area's most active and dedicated ornithologists. A news agent's day starts early. Being a rural community, the papers are delivered further afield than one would get in the town. If being a news agent is John's livelihood, his work as a member of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds is a vacation. The first job is the recording of bird population by ringing. This operation of putting an identification ring on the young bird's leg is quite harmless to the growing bird and can sometimes be essential to their very existence. Tawny owls are quite common. Far less common are the colourful golden plover, a bird of the high moors, whose colour gives the species the essential camouflage for a ground nesting bird. If the golden plover are counted in pairs, the starlings are counted in their hundreds of thousands. The numbers greatly increase by the influx of continental visitors during the winter months. The starlings are hardly in danger of extinction and due to their numbers can cause damage to woodlands with their droppings. Yet six months on there's this strange side effect of tomato plants growing from the undigested seeds in the droppings. One of the first jobs in the early months is the netting and ringing of another winter visitor, the redwing, a bird that will soon be returning to the northern Scandinavian countries for the summer. The root count too also heralds the coming of spring, as does the first mizzle thrushes and dippers. Adjoining Cliviger Hall are several acres of woodland. Mr. Halstead, the owner, is only too pleased to lend his ladders to John to ring the tawny owls here. Another tawny owl nest site, a tree that John has climbed many times before.
John has erected many owl boxes during the years because of the decline of natural nesting sites and they are always quickly adopted. Before John set out to net the barn owl that had taken up residence here, he had to make sure it was alone. To net a mated pair could cause more harm than good. Every so often, in the life of an ornithologist, something special occurs. It may be hard for us to realise the thrill John first got when he discovered this family of long-eared owls, the first recorded breeding pair in this part of the country. June and the moorland cotton grass is out. Here is the basic diet of the twight. Roping the moor has been found to be one of the best ways of discovering this well camouflaged little bird which lives in small colonies on high moorland. The nest sites have to be marked so that after hatching the young chicks can be wrung. Of course, not only the twight are disturbed during the roping. Curlews too breed on the moorland. In this case, the newly hatched curlew chicks have to be wrung within 24 hours of hatching before the chicks seek more cover. Like the curlew, the small dunlin spends most of its life on estuaries and mudflats by the sea, yet still chooses to breed on the moor. Eight miles an evening isn't unusual for John and his helpers to tramp the moor at this time of year, tramping from one mark nest to another to ring the newly hatched young twight. So as to cause the least disturbance, the twite are rung from seven to eight days after hatching. The crop of this young twite is full of cotton grass seeds. One of John's favourite birds is the little known stock dove that nests mainly in old buildings which lie below the tops of the moors. Brian and Graham are two keen lads that have accompanied John throughout the season and have proved invaluable in the work. Both are now quite familiar with the stock dove, a bird perhaps that up till now most of us didn't know existed. Sometimes John needs the special skills of Peter Lord to reach the almost inaccessible nest sites of the kestrel. Thank you. 
Here, the kestrel has chosen a tree to raise its family in an old magpie's nest. This kestrel's nest site is just a ledge in an old quarry. Even when only a few weeks old, there is no mistaking the curved beak of a bird of prey. The sparrowhawk is far less common than the kestrel in this area, and with nest sites like these, maybe the climber thinks that's just as well. The lighter coloured sparrowhawk chick is far less aggressive than the kestrel at the same age. From mid-July onwards, John concentrates on swallows. Many of the birds netted are almost like old friends, having made the long journey each year to Africa for the past five seasons. Some of these birds he has rung in previous years have also been re-trapped in South Africa. By September, the workload lessens but they're still the monthly duck count during the winter, a job that John has done for over 15 years, a job that means visiting 11 reservoirs to take the census of the duck population for the Wild Fowl Trust. As the nights draw in and most of the field work is over, there's more time to fill in the records and returns, a year that John can look back on with satisfaction, which for him has had its great moments. The first nesting in this area of a long-eared owl. The first time he discovered a pair of twite nesting in a clump of bracken in a wall. There's also the satisfaction of meeting people like Mr. Halstead, a landowner who is only too willing to help. John would be the first to admit that he couldn't achieve all this on his own without an encouraging number of people willing to help. The knowledge in these volumes wasn't completed overnight, but throughout the years, with men like John willing to devote part of their lives in the recording and preservation of the bird life of our countryside for all to enjoy.